In a time where Australia has experienced its first ever terrorist attack with the Sydney Hilton bombing, killing three people and injuring 11 others, the foundation of heinous crimes is quickly being laid in Australia, a country not used to seeing anything of this sort in its 150 year past, despite being colonised by some of the British Empire's worst criminals. Australians realise that even they are no longer exempt to adding to the list of the world's deepest and darkest individuals. So on March 16th, 1978, Australia is quickly accepting the rapid growing trend of these sickening crimes as the Adelaide Supreme Court jury finds a 33-year-old man guilty of murdering his ex-lover, her two young sons, and a poor attempt at covering his tracks, whilst also adding to the city of Adelaide's reputation of being the murder capital of Australia. Welcome back everyone. Tonight, I'll introduce you to one of Australia's worst, James Beauregard Smith. The city of Adelaide and its people have become the centre of attention in the Australian media in recent months, causing many to take notice of the city of churches. Not only for its integral status as Port City and Australia's home to carmaker Holden, but also for earning the rumour of Australia's murder capital. Just months prior, Adelaide was shocked by the Bartholomew and Truro murders, but now a new player has entered the scene and he's going to give not just South Australia, but the entire nation's most notorious serial killers a run for their money. In Woodside, South Australia, just 37 kilometres or 23 miles from Adelaide, 32-year-old woman Sandra Holland has started becoming involved with a man she meets after responding to his Lonely Hearts advertisement in The Advertiser, a South Australian newspaper. His name is James Smith, a charming 33-year-old man who had recently come to South Australia from Interstate. The pair become close during the latter half of 1976, and Smith spends more time with Sandra and her sons and young daughter. He becomes infatuated by Holland and increasingly controlling as her arguments become more frequent and intense. And by July 12, 1977, Mrs. Holland has endured enough. On this night, while the friend sits with her, the 32-year-old tells Smith on the phone, Don't ring me up again. I don't want you around anymore. Smith is livid and doesn't know what to do. So the following night, he goes over to Mrs. Holland's Ashley Ave home in Ridgehaven and an argument erupts. She's at home with her two young sons, 11-year-old Thomas, who the family called Scott, and 9-year-old Craig. Smith knocks Holland unconscious, then strangles her when she tells him she wants to win the affair and return to her husband. Young Craig walks into the room during the strangulation. As soon as she loses her life, he chases the panicked boy who runs to his brother for help. Smith chases Craig into the family bathroom, where the boy's brother, Scott, is having a bath. Scott's unaware of the events that have just occurred moments ago and is unable to react before being forced into the water head first and held under until he loses his life. Young Craig is then manhandled into the bathtub beside his brother and is given a similar fate at the hands of Smith. And within a minute, James Smith has officially become a serial killer. Smith steals two family televisions, unable to resist the urge of taking the colour TV for himself. He also has one more problem. What to do with Miss Holland's five-year-old daughter who remains alive and unharmed inside the home? Smith is currently renting a flat on West Street at Hectorville and is currently being occupied by two girls aged 16 and 17. He returns home after murdering his ex-lover and her two sons, unloads the two television sets and other household items from Holland's car and into the flat, telling the teenagers he found the goods in a house at the end of a dirt road. The next morning, he goes back to the house and retrieves his ex-lover's young daughter, bringing her to the flat and asks the girls to look after her, but eventually takes her to the Murray Bridge home of Roslyn Stein, a woman who is under his spell. Despite his unflattering appearance, Smith's lonely heart advertisement had attracted more than one woman. Stein is now left with the five-year-old girl whose family Smith had just killed, while Smith goes to deal with his next problem. How to ensure the bodies of Sandra, Craig and Scott are never found. He returns to the home once again. He retrieves each body and wraps each one in a bedsheet, then uses electrical flex to bind both ends. He loads all three bodies into his ex-lover's car and begins his disposal of the bodies. He first dumps Sandra and Scott in a pile of vegetation set to be burnt at the Woodside rubbish tip. And then finally, he hides Craig's body under the floorboards in a derelict house next door 
to his own home. Once he's dumped the bodies, Smith drives Holland's car to Wingfield, a suburb of Adelaide, then removes the wheels and motor from the Austin Lancer before setting it alight, hoping to throw detectives off the scent. But still in possession of the daughter, Miss Stein calls police and reports the incident to them. They come to collect the girl and launch an official investigation into the disappearance of her mother and two brothers. Two days after disposing of the bodies, Smith is drinking at the Glynd Hotel when a Holden Hill CIB detective approaches. Smith runs from the pub but is quickly caught and interviewed for almost seven hours, during which he tells detectives he believes Sandra had gone to Loxton, a town approximately three hours west of Adelaide. Smith adds that he suspects Holland may have had another man in life, but assures police he is confident nothing bad has happened to her or her sons, stating, Yeah, you wait. She'll turn up and so will the kids. As police continue their questioning about the trio, Smith snaps, stating, I'm no friggin' murderer. Unsurprisingly, Smith's protestations of innocence does little to allay the fears of major crime detectives and relatives. None of them believe Sandra Holland will abandon her daughter to a stranger in a town 70 kilometers away, and Smith seemed the logical suspect. Their worst fears are realized on Saturday, July 17th, when Craig Holland's body is found underneath the floorboards of the house next to Smith's flat. On the same day, Sandra Holland's burnt out car is found at the Wingfield dump. After unwrapping the body, an autopsy later shows that Craig has bruises on the left side of his face and neck, consistent with being held under water until he drowned. Despite the grim discovery, it would be several weeks until the bodies of Sandra and Scott are uncovered. The search creates huge media interest as hundreds of volunteers help scour various homes and properties in and around Adelaide. Any hopes of a miraculous ending though are dashed in early August 1977 when a highway department worker is preparing to set fire to a pile of trees and grass at the Woodside rubbish tip and notices a foot protruding from the vegetation. The trial begins in February 1978 with Supreme Court Judge Kevin Duggan leading the prosecution case. The evidence is stacked up against him. The jury hears that the footprints found at the derelict West Street house matches Smith's work boots. A single chip of wood found in his Ford Falcon matches a missing piece in the floorboards of the abandoned house. A bloodstain found in Smith's jeans is not his, and his fingerprint is found on a glass from a broken buffet at Sandra Holland's house. Other items from Holland's home are found dumped on a vacant block at North Street, Hectorville, near Smith's flat. The trial also hears evidence from a former co-worker of Smith, who tells the jury of a remark the accused killer made, claiming it's easy to get away with murder. During the trial, Smith reads an unsworn statement from the dock, claiming he loved Ms. Holland and had been worried sick about her and her boys. I just wish to say that I had no reason to want to kill Sandra or the boys. I wanted to marry her. I was very fond of her children. He pleads to the jury. He adds, when I advertised to meet a woman for companionship and friendship, I put in the advertisement that I wanted one with children. Despite his testimony, he shows no remorse for his actions and is later diagnosed by professionals as a psychopath. The nation is outraged hearing these crimes and his responses and they want capital punishment brought back or at least for James Smith to be the exception in a series of protests and appeals. Though he's sentenced to life in prison, James Smith would taste freedom twice more, one by legal means and another in a daring escape. By today's standards, it would be unthinkable that a man convicted of three murders could be allowed to mingle with the public outside prison less than five years after his crime. But in August 1982, Smith is part of the Itala CFS Brigade, which also includes Clifford Bartholomew, who had shot and killed ten members of his family in a massacre at Hope Valley years earlier. The members of the prison firefighting unit are granted a day release to take part in the CFS display at Riverton in the mid-north. Smith offers another inmate $8,000 to help set up an escape, despite never paying. Smith executes his master plan of escape by wandering away from the group and escaping the gaze of those charged with supervising the triple murderer and his mates. By the time the alarm is raised, Smith has vanished, sparking one of the largest manhunts ever seen in the state of South Australia. Dozens of armed police from South Australia, New South Wales and Victoria use horses, motorbikes and helicopters in an effort to find Smith, who the public is urged not to approach and to consider potentially armed and dangerous. 
Unable to locate one of Australia's most dangerous and newly convicted serial killers, police turn to Aboriginal tracker Jimmy James, whose expertise ultimately leads to Smith's apprehension a week later. The British Empire have used the Aboriginals to find food, water and missing people throughout the history of their settlement due to the hunter-gatherer lifestyle the Aboriginals have, the most important survival instinct for any Australian. Smith, who is now 69, is found on the morning of August 28, 1982, asleep under the tree in a remote scrub about 70 k's from Renmark, just over the New South Wales border. Dressed in shorts, a cap, and an open flannel shirt, Smith puts up no resistance and is described as being in a jovial mood, chatting to his captor while being returned to Adelaide. As soon as Australia believes they've heard the last of James Smith, who locals hope rots in prison for his crimes, the possibility of him being released back into the community strikes again. While serving his life sentence in Yatala Labor Prison in 1985, Smith begins writing with pen pal Barbara Beauregard, an American national, and the two marry. Smith, who was working as a storeman in B Division at Yatala and Miss Beauregard, marry inside the prison later that year. He legally changes his name to James Beauregard Smith, taking his wife's last name, and she moves into a small home at Northfield, close to the prison, to be near her husband. And in the centre of the public eye, Reporters are quick to track down the new Mrs. Smith and remind her of her husband's criminal past. Mrs. Smith screams at reporters seeking her story, in one report stating, Leave us alone. We only want to be together. I am sick and tired of the newspapers calling my husband a killer. But not long after, seeing it as a potential lucrative venture, she offers her story to the highest bidder, adding, Why should I not make money out of this? We've been treated badly enough already. The couple fight against all odds as Mr. Smith is determined to be released. Prison superiors and peers regard him as a model prisoner, and despite his escape three years prior, is able to charm psychiatrists who recommend his release in 1988. A forensic psychologist tells the Supreme Court in September 1988 that it's the optimal time to release Smith, arguing that he's reformed and is no longer a threat to anyone in the community. And on April 1st, 1994, he's released on parole. Just eight days after he's a free man, Smith somehow ends up in a car with a 21-year-old woman. He drives the woman to a remote spot at Cuttle Creek in the Adelaide Hills and repeatedly rapes her. The victim suffers bruising to her legs and arms as she's dragged back into the car after repeatedly trying to escape her captor's clutches and is ultimately successful. She reports the crime to police and James Beauregard Smith is taken back into police custody. Smith denies the attack and that he had paid the woman for sex three times prior. But with his prior convictions and evidence stacked up against him, Smith is sentenced to a further eight years in prison, meaning his non-parole period would end in 2009. James Beauregard Smith is still in prison till today as doctors and officials aren't falling for his charming ways anymore. He's still married despite the rape and assault allegations and still continues to fight for his freedom. That brings us to the end of the video. If you liked it, give this video a like and sub to the channel if you haven't already. I'd like to give a special thanks to Forewarnings. She did an amazing job on the Aussie accent there and uh, obviously as herself during the uh, during the American lines as well. Uh, <laughs> that was fucking amazing. Like She is very talented. So make sure you go check her channel out. I've put a link in the description below. Make sure you give her a sub, make sure you check out her videos and give it a like and all that sort of stuff, leave some comments, because honestly, um, she's a very broad sort of uh, voice actor and all that sort of stuff, and uh, that's the direction you know she'd like to take on YouTube, so definitely check her out for me, give her a sub. I'm also going to go back into some true stories and all that kind of stuff, uh, some true Aussie um, horror stories, back to what uh, I started the channel with, so um, I'm currently working on stuff in the background as well as some uh, more true crime stories for you and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you've got any true creepy encounters that happened to you, I'm collecting them now, so uh, send me through your stories to thisismisterreality at gmail.com. Same thing with any ideas, you know, uh, if there's any more serial killers or psychos. It doesn't have to be a serial killer, it can just be a killer. It can be, you know, uh, mysteries as well, you know, um, things that can't be explained, um, that are all Aussie related. Um, if you've got any ideas, shoot them through in an email or drop them in the comments below. And uh, in the meantime, follow me on the social media links below. I've got a Discord server there that you can join in. Uh, I've got a Facebook you can follow and I've got a Twitter which I'm mainly on anyway so um, feel free to follow me on, on any of those and uh, yeah and I'll see you guys on the next video. Cheers guys.